Last summer, I started working at Domino's. I'm 32, which is at least 10 years older than all my co-workers, including my boss. It's a humiliating job, but I need the money. I'd worked for years in IT, but after the company went under, I couldn't find anything better than pizza delivery. I hated it. One night, I was at the restaurant taking orders when I answered the call of a woman who needed three large pizzas for a party she was having. Even over the phone, I could tell that this was one of those nightmare customers that needed everything to be absolutely perfect. She literally told me the exact number of pepperonis she needed on each slice. I tried to be as polite as possible, even after she made me promise that the pizzas would be exactly how she wanted them. I promised, of course. Then, when it was time to deliver her order, I was the only one available. I was hoping someone else would do it, but all my co-workers were too busy. I got my car, and I drove all the way across town. The woman named Sarah lived in one of those McMansions that tries really hard to look expensive. It had grand columns and a long driveway. I parked at the front and then rang the doorbell. The woman who answered the door looked very different from what I expected. She was gorgeous. She was wearing a red dress and a lot of jewelry. I tried to hand her the pizzas, but she wouldn't take them until I promised that everything was made exactly how she wanted. I assured her that it was. She grabbed the boxes and then stood right in front of me as she opened each one to examine the pizzas. She wouldn't pay me until she checked everything. I stood there awkwardly as she studied the pizzas and counted the number of pepperonis. Then she said, I'll be right back. She took the pizzas and walked back into the house. She left the door open behind her. I peered into the house, expecting to see other people there, but the place seemed dark and empty. After a few long minutes, she came back out with a little clutch purse. She started digging through it. I assumed she was pulling out the cash, but instead, she pulled out a pistol and pointed it right at my head. I completely froze, raising both arms in the air. What was going on? You were three pepperonis short, she muttered. I tried to apologize, but I was too shocked to speak. Come inside, she ordered. Now! No one had ever pointed a gun at me before. I did what I was told. I walked inside, and she closed the door. Then, she circled around behind me and shoved the pistol against my back. Walk, she ordered. She pushed me through the front room and down a long, dark hallway. Then she ordered me to take a left. I ended up in a large bedroom where the oldest man I'd ever seen was lying in a bed. He was hooked up to all these tubes and medical equipment. A heart monitor beeped in the corner. Honey, Sarah told the man, the pizzas are wrong. The man said something through the tubes attached to his face, but it didn't sound like real words. I guess Sarah understood what he said perfectly because she answered, I know, I'm disappointed too. The pizza boxes were already sitting on the table at the foot of the man's bed. They were right next to a giant blender. By now, I was finally able to speak. What do you want me to do? She looked at me, smiling for the first time since I'd seen her. Then, she screamed as loud as she could, Apologize to my husband! I looked down at the man on the bed. He barely looked alive. I'm, uh, sorry, I said. The man responded, but again I couldn't make out what he was saying. Sarah cocked her gun, still aiming it at me. Well, she said, you heard the man. I started crying. I, I, I don't know what you want me to do. Feed him! She screamed. I walked toward the table and opened one of the pizza boxes. I looked around for plates, but there weren't any, so I just grabbed a slice and started walking toward the man. Not like that! She screamed. He can't eat solid foods! With her gun, she gestured toward the giant blender on the table. I was still crying. I couldn't help it. 
I slid the pizza slice into the top of the blender and closed the lid. Then I looked back at Sarah, still confused about what she wanted. Use the mint setting, she said. I pressed the button labeled mints, and the blender whirred to life. In seconds, it had blended the pizza slice into a brown and red sludge. Then I just stood there, waiting for the woman to tell me what to do. Jesus, she screamed, just feed him already. I twisted off the top of the blender and carried it towards her husband's bed. The closer I got to him, the more I could smell him. He smelled like he was already dead. His skin looked like yellow crepe paper. He must have been at least a hundred years old. Sarah stared at me, gun still raised. I reached forward and pulled off the plastic breathing thing that was over the man's mouth. Then I tipped the blender cup against his lips and poured the pizza liquid into his mouth. Ugh, I'll always remember the sound he made as he slurped it up. He swallowed about half of the liquid before he started choking. Behind me, Sarah screamed in horror. You're killing him, you psycho! I pulled back the blender cup and set it back on the table as Sarah ran to her husband with a towel. She wiped at his face and kept telling him, It's okay, baby, it's okay! And the man kept coughing. I noticed that she'd set down the gun while she was wiping him. Without thinking, I raced out of the room and down the hall. I ran out of the front door and jumped into my car. All the while, I could hear Sarah screaming behind me, We're not finished! Terrified and panting, I sped away from that bizarre nightmare, my heart racing. I couldn't comprehend what had just transpired in that McMansion. As I drove down the dimly lit streets, I couldn't shake the image of the elderly man struggling to breathe, drowning in blended pizza. I had inadvertently participated in a macabre episode. The headlights of my car pierced the darkness as I reached the Domino store. I stumbled through the entrance, my co-workers and boss busy with their usual tasks. I found my boss, Mike, leaning against the counter, scrolling through his phone. Mike, you won't believe what just happened on that delivery, I stammered. Mike glanced up, his brow furrowed. What are you talking about? You look like you've seen a ghost. I recounted the bizarre ordeal, from the demanding customer to the elderly man and the horrifying pizza concoction. Mike's eyes widened in disbelief. That's insane, man. Are you okay? Oh, I'm just glad to be out of there, I replied, shuddering. Just then, the door swung open and Sarah strode in, still wearing that red dress and jewelry. Her presence silenced the room. She fixed her intense gaze on me. You, she said, her tone chillingly calm. You left before I could tip you. Mike stepped forward, a concerned frown etching his face. Listen, lady, you're not tipping someone who went through what you did, he said sternly. Sarah, undeterred, reached into her clutch purse and pulled out an envelope. Not of cash, but a printed letter. She handed it to me, a smug smile on her face. Open it when you get home, she said, her voice dripping with venom. Then she turned and left the store. Curiosity peaked. I cautiously unfolded the letter once she was gone. Inside, I found a job offer from a prestigious tech company, along with an address for an interview the next day. As the reality of my unexpected salvation sunk in, I couldn't help but wonder if there was more to Sarah's twisted game. Nonetheless, I sped towards the address, hoping that the nightmare was truly over and that a brighter future awaited me. I haven't seen Maddie since that sleepover when we were 13. The paramedics, police, and our parents separated us, and once things cooled down, we, or rather I, chose to stay away from her. That night felt like an eternity. 
I still remember the sirens blaring as we held each other in the dark and damp lakeshore, waiting for anyone to find us. Two helpless deers in headlights. I remember shivering, chattering my teeth so hard I felt like I'd bitten off my tongue. Pajamas drenched, head to toe, I stared into Maddie's sunken eyes. They were bloodshot and unforgiving, with the embossed little veins creeping in her eyeballs. She'd been scared to death, I thought then. And for all I've known since, she might as well have been. When we went to bed that night, Maddie and I were safely tucked in together, inseparable as we had been since grade school, a friends forever type of bond. But something bad happened that night. Other than my parents arguing the night away, something else happened that I couldn't recall, no matter how hard I tried. I do know one thing, a gut feeling I couldn't shake off, that from then on, I had to stay away from Maddie. Being a 13-year-old, I immediately followed my impulses and refused to see her, refused to go to school with her, refused to talk to her. Everyone thought that this was some sort of trauma response. My parents allowed me to switch schools, and they never asked me anything about Maddie ever again. I made new friends and moved on, and eventually everyone moved on. Everyone forgot all about the night we had a sleepover and ended up at Silver Lake the following morning. The strange tragedy became nothing more than a distant memory. That is, until I saw her again. Across the bonfire, Maddie stood in front of me. An unwelcome yet anticipated specter that night at the town's get-together, the summer bonfire by Silver Woods. It had been four years since I'd seen her. Puberty certainly did a number on her, yet I still would have recognized her anywhere. Those bloodshot eyes forever etched in my head. Maddie, I called out, albeit a bit hesitantly. But she was laser-focused on arguing with a guy in front of her. He looked like the football team type. They had to be together. I watched the fight escalate and flinched when he raised his hand as if he was going to hit her. Maddie stood up to him, though. She caught his hand by the wrist and challenged him to hit her. This took me by surprise. Maddie was always the braver one between the two of us, but I wouldn't have expected her to do something like stand up to a guy twice her size with ease. The guy stared daggers at first, but then chose to storm off after a few seconds. A wise decision given how she looked like she was ready to roundhouse kick him into the bonfire. Confident that she'd won, Maddie sat down and made herself comfortable. She watched the flames, and they danced in her eyes. And then suddenly, she was watching me. It took me a few seconds to register this. Across the bonfire, Maddie was staring right at me. Um, hi? I managed to let out. She raised an eyebrow and immediately made her way over. Lana? She asked as if she'd seen a ghost. <laughs> that was mutual. Uh-huh. I managed to utter before she rushed over to give me a bear hug. Ah, I melted into her arms immediately. I missed her. I had to stay away from her for some reason, but at, at the end of the day, she was still my best friend. The only person who knew how to help me get out of my head back then. And I'm clinging to the hope that maybe she could do that to me now. We ended up walking through Silver Woods, sharing stories from the past four years. She talked all about that annoying guy on the football team she was dating and how they were probably done for good. I talked about my parents and how the family dog passed away two weeks ago, and we cried together. Somehow, unconsciously, finding our way back to Silver Lake. The water lapped at our feet, and I saw how distressed Maddie looked. What happened that night? I asked her, barely a whisper. You already know, she replied, all innocent, as she stepped further into the water. No, Maddie, I don't know. I don't remember anything about the sleepover. Nothing at all. Nothing except the fact that 
I should be scared of you. Well, Lana, she said, turning around, her voice different, deeper. You were sleeping, and I was sleeping too. That's what you remember, right? But what else do you remember about me? You've been my best friend for a while now. What else do you know about me? Uh, I, I know we met at elementary school. And what else? You should know more than that, she asked, stepping further into the lake, the water by her waist. I... I stuttered because I didn't know. I knew what emotion she made me feel, but nothing else about her. She was right. Who were her parents? Where did she live? She was swimming in the lake now. Because I'm not real, Lana. What? I said, trying to make sense of what she'd said as I waded my way over to her. I reached her in the middle of the lake and looked right into those beautiful, bloodshot eyes of her. Trying my best to keep myself afloat, I was never a good swimmer. I'm death, Lana. You turned to me when you were 13, and you're turning to me again now. Such a sad child. You should really learn how to not let other people's problems define you. Well, maybe in your next life. That's it. That's the answer I've been looking for. I guess everyone experienced death differently, and she was right. I saw my parents fight that night and decided to climb out the window, walking all the way to the lake to look for some peace and quiet, as I've done now. It wasn't Maddie that fought her boyfriend. I did. I fought with my boyfriend, and I walked all by myself to Silver Lake to drown again. But Maddie, she was death. She's right. I, I struggled to stay afloat. My mind reeling from Maddie's shocking revelation. As I floundered in the water, gasping for breath, I realized I had a choice to make. I couldn't let death claim me. Not again. Not this early in my life. I had already cheated Maddie once. I could do it again. With heavy arms and weak legs, I swam back to the shore. I could see Maddie watching me from the water. The flames in her eyes seemed to dance with anticipation. You won't take me, Maddie. Not until it's time. It was just before midnight, and I was on my last delivery of the night. The address was in a part of town I'd never heard of before, and I had to plug it into my GPS system to even figure out which direction to go. As I left behind the cozy suburban neighborhoods and the street lamps became sparser and dimmer, I started to question if I was going the right way after all. Who would be ordering pizza all the way out here? I left the highway and ended up on a dusty old track in the middle of nowhere, my GPS estimating me to be five minutes away. I could only hope that I'd be getting a generous tip for driving all the way out here. Surely only someone with a big mansion or a farmhouse would live out here in the outskirts of town. I followed the track between the trees, the road rutted with stones and dips that sent me, and the pizza sliding all over the place. Finally the road evened out, and I found myself driving up the gravel path towards a large, shadowy house, three stories high, with dark gray bricks and a black roof. There was something inherently gothic and eerie about the place. Who would live in a house like this, if not for some old-fashioned recluse? It didn't strike me as the kind of place that belonged to someone who ordered pizza takeout, especially just before midnight. Was it some kids messing with me? Nevertheless, this was the address we'd been given, and I couldn't finish up my shift until the last pizza had been delivered and paid for. Gathering myself, I parked the car outside the tall black trellis fence and climbed out, grabbing the still-hot pizza box and tucking it beneath my arm. The whole house was dark, shrouded in the gloom of dusk. It didn't even look like anyone was home. I was starting to suspect that this was some kind of prank after all, some kids calling the poor old delivery driver out to the middle of nowhere for laughs. The thought made me grip my teeth, but I stepped up to the fence anyway, 
The latch was undone, so I pushed it open, wincing as it let out a low creak that wailed off into the night. The front lawn was overgrown and choked with weeds and tall wiry grass that crunched when I walked over it, unable to see the path in the dark. There was nothing but the lights from my car to light the way. If they went out, then I would be stranded in pitch darkness, nothing but the dim glow of the moon to light my way. I walked up to the front porch and threw a glance over the dark windows. Was this place abandoned after all? Shifting the pizza box, I raised a fist and knocked. The wood peeled and flaked beneath my touch. No answer. No lights came on. Either there was nobody home, or they were already deep asleep. I knocked again, shifting my feet impatiently. I'd rather not class this order as undelivered, but if there was nobody to pay me and take it off my hands, I wouldn't have a choice. The wind wailed quietly through the house's rafters as I waited, to no avail. Just as I was about to turn around and head back to the car, a faint light flickered on in one of the windows. The light was dim, barely cutting through the dusk, but it gave me the sign I needed that someone was in there after all. With a sigh, I went to knock again. The moment my fist touched the flaky wood, the door creaked open. I waited, darkness pooling at my feet, but nobody appeared. Hello? I called, nudging the door open wider. Pizza delivery? Anyone there? No answer. Was someone really messing with me at midnight on a Friday evening? Growing impatient, I pushed the door open fully and stepped inside. The entryway was empty. Dust hung heavy and clouded in the air, the smell of mildew seeping through the fresh air blowing in through the doorway. Pizza delivery, I called out. Anyone home? When nobody came to greet me, I decided to head further in, to the room where the light had been. Maybe they were an invalid, unable to answer the door on their own? If there was someone here, then I wasn't leaving until I got paid for the pizza. The rest of the house was eerily quiet. Nothing stirred except for the dust billowing out from my breath. The entire place seemed like it hadn't been touched for years. It felt abandoned, unlived in, untouched by human warmth for decades. I began to wonder if it was safe for me to stay here. What if vagrants were hiding in the shadows waiting to jump me? Or kids were playing a prank? I'd stupidly left my keys in the engine, thinking I'd be right back. Anyone could drive off with my car and leave me stranded in the middle of nowhere. The thought made me shudder, and I quickened my pace, footfalls echoing around me as I walked towards the room with the light. The door was shut, but the same faint orange glow seeped out beneath the doorframe. Hello? Pizza delivery? I called through the door, wrapping my knuckles against it. I thought, for a second, that I heard a shiver of movement on the other side of the door, and then silence again. Rolling my eyes, I tried the handle and pushed the door open, the light spreading across the hall. The smell hit me immediately, and I recoiled in disgust. The air was heavy with rot and decay. Pinching my nose with my hand, I looked inside the dimly lit room. My gaze skimmed past the dusty, soot-stained fireplace and rotten, moth-eaten curtains, and an old table lamp that filled the room with a low, humming buzz. Someone was sitting in an armchair by the cold fire, waiting by an old-fashioned telephone. I could just make out the top of their head. Uh, excuse me, I called, trying not to breathe in the smell. What was that? You ordered pizza? When I received no response, I went around the armchair and peered at the person. The pizza fell right out of my hands, hitting the floor with a soft thud. I staggered back, covering my mouth with my hand as horror clenched my chest. Sitting in the armchair was little more than rotten flesh and bone, a body long decayed by time, gaunt and skeletal. It was clear they had been dead for a while. How long had it been since anyone had come out here? And who had given this address? I began to suspect that it had been a mistake when I saw a scrap of paper sitting by the telephone. Scribbled in faded ink was the number to the pizza place where I worked. It wasn't a mistake at all. Nausea bumped up my throat as I turned and fled the room, trying to get the gruesome visage of the decayed body out of my mind. 
Once outside, I got back into my car and called the police, then hightailed it out of there. This incident might not be much scary for you, but it was enough to spook me out and fill my nights with nightmares for months to come. I'd been working as a sandwich artist at Subway for the last two years. It wasn't the highest paying job, but my boss Dave had been great about working around my class schedule, so it seemed like the best option for me before I graduated. I usually worked evenings, meaning the hours were slow, especially right before we closed at 10. That was the time we'd get really sketchy people, often homeless men who'd finally scrounged enough money to buy a six inch. Occasionally, guys would come in who were very clearly tripping on you know what, and I'd have to treat them very carefully. Because I was always the only worker there, my mother often worried that something bad would happen. She begged me to get a safer job, but I always told her everything was totally safe, and I genuinely believed that too. This all went down a few hours ago. I was 30 minutes from closing up and I hadn't had a single customer in over an hour. We had rules against using our phones during work hours, so I had to just stand there and wait. I guess I was zoning out because I didn't notice the man walk in until he was standing right in front of the counter. He was in his 20s, a few years older than me, and jarringly handsome. Tall, muscular, dark eyes that seemed to bore into me. He looked like a movie star. I asked him what he wanted and instead of answering my question he said, You're all alone here, huh? It was such a strange thing to say but I didn't feel scared, not yet anyway. I guess that's how it goes. Beautiful people like this guy could say whatever creepy things they wanted and never strike the wrong nerve. Again, I asked him what he wanted. He smiled and ordered a tuna sandwich. As I went through the typical questions, what size, what kind of bread, he reached into his pocket and pulled out a small black object. I didn't recognize it until he held it up and started staring at it. This was a taser. One of those things that policemen use to shock people. What are you doing? I asked. He didn't answer my question, instead listing off all the vegetables he wanted on the sandwich. He didn't look at me, just staring at the taser as if it was the most fascinating thing in the world. I didn't move. Fear coursed through me, and it was like I had no control over my body. My arms hung uselessly at my sides. Did you hear me? He asked. I said I wanted tomatoes. When I still didn't move, he stuck the taser towards me. Have you ever felt 50,000 volts course through your body? I haven't, but I'm sure it's not pleasant. What do you want? My voice sounded so high-pitched, so weak, I could barely breathe. Tomatoes and lettuce, he shouted. And then he laughed. <laughs> and I want you, Tracy. <laughs> Hearing this lunatic say my name out loud felt like the worst possible violation. It felt wrong. I had a name tag, so customers sometimes called me by my name, but it didn't happen often, and it didn't feel like this. Then I realized that I wasn't wearing my name tag. Somehow this psycho already knew who I was. Who are you? I asked. By that point, I had regained some control over my body. I inched backwards. No one he said. Then he smiled slowly. You know, this is a pretty dangerous part of town, especially this time of night. He moved the taser closer. A pretty girl like you? You shouldn't be here. Don't hurt me, I said. I'll give you everything in the register. He shook his head. No. He didn't move for the longest time, just waiting with his weapon outstretched. One side of his mouth quirked upwards into a smile. Then he lowered the taser. Actually, I don't want a sandwich anymore. See you around, Tracy. He turned to leave, moving slowly, casually. A normal person would have raced into the back room, locked the door, and called the police. That's what I should have done. But something came over me in the moment, complete and total anger. I'd never been threatened like that before. I never looked danger in the face. Before I realized what I was even doing, I grabbed one of the sandwich knives from the counter and raced after him. 
In seconds, I tackled him to the ground. I screamed something at him, right in his face, but in the excitement of the moment, I don't remember what I said. As he fell, the taser skidded out of his hand. He struggled to get free, but I held him down. His legs kicked under me, but I wouldn't budge. I pushed the knife against his throat. Who are you? I screamed into his face. What do you want? Stop, he begged. His eyes welled with tears. Just seconds ago, he looked like a psychotic killer. Now he was bawling like a baby. Still pressing the knife against his skin, I reached over and grabbed the taser. When I held it in my other hand, I realized that it was a fake. It was a toy. He jerked to the side, trying to get away, but in that movement, my knife accidentally cut into his throat. I saw blood oozing out. He started to choke. Who are you? I said again. Your, your mother, he spurted. Blood was coming out of his mouth. What? My mother? Your, your mother paid me to scare you, he sputtered. She, she wants you to, to quit. She, she wants you to find a safer job. I, I'm just an actor. More blood oozed out. Instantly, I jumped off him. I stood over his twitching body as he held onto his neck. I called 911, of course, and then told him to send an ambulance right away. It took them five minutes to get there. By then, the man had lost a lot of blood. I'm at the police station now, and I have no idea how to explain what happened. I guess I'll tell them the truth. I'll tell them that I didn't mean to slash that man's throat. But who knows if they'll believe me. You believe me, don't you? You know that it was all just an accident, right? <laughs>